Dear friends, welcome to our program, God Speaks Today. Uh, this is Roberto Miranda from Congregation Lion of Judah here in Boston. And I would like to begin uh, a series of meditations on the book of Philippians, written, of course, by the Apostle Paul to the congregation at Philippi. And I believe that this is one of the greatest, uh, most uh, profound, richest letters in the New Testament and uh, worthy of an extended uh, meditation. And I'd like to just spend some time with you exploring it and um, highlighting some of the beautiful concepts that it uh, uh, brings out. A very practical letter, uh, a letter that is uh, warm, um, engaging, uh, that speaks of friendship, of joy in the midst of trials and tribulations, of the, the victory that we have in Jesus Christ, even when we go through difficult trials. Um, it is a letter about optimism and about the power that we have in the Holy Spirit that dwells in each uh, believer. And the fact that we can be overcomers in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. So I'd just like to uh, delve into this letter and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed uh, studying it uh, in preparation for this time. The letter uh, has an introduction that I think is extremely rich all by itself and actually it has some concepts that um, it would be very easy to overlook but when we uh, stop to examine them one by one we see that these uh, five six lines of the introduction to the book of Philippians already have some extraordinarily um, enriching ideas uh, that, that can really uh, serve to uh, strengthen our spiritual walk. So I'll just begin. The, the, the letter says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said a couple of uh, seconds ago, it would be very easy to just see this as a mere preface and you know, the idea is, well, let's go into the body of the letter because th really that's where the substance is. But if we did that, I think we would lose uh, some extraordinary opportunities to, to uh, enrich ourselves because uh, as I see this, this word, uh, servants of Christ Jesus. And by the way, uh, when Paul says Paul and Timothy, it's not that uh, Timothy was also um, uh, jailed along with Paul. We know that this letter to the Philippians was written from a Roman prison and that Paul was awaiting uh, being uh, finally coming before a, a Roman judge and perhaps even uh, experiencing martyrdom. He wasn't sure at the moment. We believe that ultimately he did uh, experience martyrdom. He was beheaded uh, in Rome. Uh, but at this moment, he is uh, just facing a situation of great uncertainty. And he is alone in a Roman cell. But Timothy, his young companion and disciple, seems to have been in Rome as well, keeping him company, working with him in the uh, uh, Roman uh, congregations. And so Paul includes him as his uh, special uh, colleague and, and co-laborer in the gospel and so he addresses the letter as, as if both of them were writing it to the Philippians. The Philippians knew Timothy as well so he includes his dear friend and, and uh, colleague in, in, uh, in the letter and says Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus and you know my, my mind was immediately um, fixed on this word servants of Christ Jesus. The word servant in the original Greek is uh, doulos, which is a word that really, um, in, in its original historical meaning, and when Paul used that word, it had so much more weight and uh, substance to it than the, the word servant conveys. Because really what Paul was saying, if we were to translate uh, the word doulos, literally, it is more like Paul and Timothy, slaves, of Christ Jesus and it was a dramatic uh, usage of that word that the Apostle Paul the Apostle Paul was engaging in and I think he did it for very deliberate uh, reasons I, I would say that perhaps what happened was that later on the translators modern translators um, found that word uh, really just uh, just too heavy too laden with all kinds of negative meanings and, and too complicated to just translate it as it was uh, uh, 
slaves of Christ Jesus. And so they kind of softened it up a little bit and found an equivalent word that was a little less uh, problematic. And so they put servants of Christ Jesus. But really when Paul was using it, he was uh, taking that word from the daily meaning and saying, you know, Paul and Timothy, we are slaves of Christ Jesus. And I think when he um, used that word in that sense, he not only wanted to kind of identify himself in a neutral way, uh, because there was a value that he held dear to himself, seeing himself as a, as a slave of Christ, but also I think he was uh, subliminally, and perhaps not so subliminally after all, uh, uh, sending a message to the Philippians as well and inviting them to identify themselves in that same way as well as uh, slaves of Christ. Now, what was a slave uh, in Greco-Roman times? We know it well. You know, the, 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 the institution of slavery in uh, these uh, times, it didn't have the kind of cruel, um, darkly oppressive uh, meaning that it had, let's say, in America in the uh, 18th century or the 19th century or in, you know, the British Isles when uh, Britain was also uh, practicing slavery or in the Spanish colonies and so on where slaves were absolutely horribly treated. But it's still, you know, the, the uh, Greco-Roman institution of slavery was still an oppressive institution, demeaning. Um, uh, it just uh, lowered the humanity of uh, individuals who, who were part of that uh, class of uh, slaves. Slaves had uh, no rights whatsoever. They had no um, independence of uh, thought, movement, decision-making. They could not uh, own property. Everything was owned by the Lord or the owner. And again, when, when uh, Paul uses the term, uh, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, he is using it in this very deliberate historic sense that he also uses the word servant or doulos or a slave. In other words, he was... He was um, there was a whole uh, wealth of meaning implied. And the idea was that uh, Paul saw himself as, a, as totally submitted to the ownership of Jesus Christ. He didn't see himself as having any kind of independence of criterion. He uh, could not uh, make decisions by himself. He owned nothing. He um, uh, could not think independently. He could not go where he wanted to. He was completely beholden. He was completely submitted to the will of his master, his owner, Jesus Christ. And so I think it's, uh, it, when Paul uses that term, uh, uh, slave of Jesus Christ, he is inviting us to enter into that same kind of self-image that he himself had adopted, that he himself lived out every day of his life. Paul, as we know, had sacrificed all kinds of... Uh, privileges. Uh, he had uh, given up his entire background as a Pharisee and as a rabbi, uh, all the privileges of being somebody highly regarded in uh, um, Jewish uh, society. And he had become a mere servant, a slave of Jesus Christ who only did what the Lord told him to do. And so I think that that's a very powerful invitation for us as well, as Paul always invites us to enter into that kind of idea and, and a way of seeing ourselves of being completely submitted to Christ, submitted to His will, submitted to the will of God, living our lives in absolute uh, submission to the Holy Spirit, asking continually the Lord, what is it that you want us to do? What do you want us to feel? What do you want us to believe? What do you want us to preach? How do you want us to uh, understand the scriptures and the Christian life? The believer who has understood this call to be a servant, a doulos, a, a slave of Christ, uh, no longer considers himself uh, his own master, master of his destiny. But rather, everything that he does, everything that she believes and, and uh, decides is predicated upon God's will for our lives. And uh, this is, of course, one of the, the great privileges of the Christian identity, but also one of the great burdens, the fact that we can no longer assume that we can live life independently, that we can make independent decisions, that our body is our own, for example, or that our, our um, bank account is our own, that our profession is our own, that our children are our own. We now live for a master 
we now live for a sovereign, a kingdom that uh, dictates uh, our decisions and dictates the nature of our life. And if we are truly uh, believers who have understood the call to servanthood, then we will realize that our greatest privilege, our greatest joy is to be totally submitted, totally committed, subjugated in many ways to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the ownership of Jesus Christ. I hope that you find that image, um, instead of being oppressive and being um, demeaning, I hope you find it elevating, really, because that's the way the Apostle Paul intended it. Nothing greater, nothing more powerful than being submitted to the will of our Lord and owner, Jesus Christ. God bless you, and uh, we will continue with our meditation in the future.